This is the World Organic News Podcast for the week ending 15th of February 2016. John Moore reporting. This week we look into the wonderful world of compost with a peek into compost tea before moving on to a new threat to bees. Well, it's new to me anyway, and maybe to you too. Firstly to compost. The verdant tinkerer, link in the show notes, gives a great description on the art of composting with earthworms, or vermicompost, to give it its correct name. This form of composting is different from the pile method. The pile, either hot or cool, takes some time, and the hot method kills off the viability of weed seeds. Neither cool composting nor vermicomposting will do that. The great benefit of vermicomposting is the exponential increase in biological activity this method encourages. By using the finished product cleared of worms, either directly on the soil or as a compost tea, the soil biota are fed, multiplied and varied. The importance of a living soil rather than a dead dirt drenched in artificial fertilisers cannot be overstated. A living soil is the greatest producer of food in variable conditions. It holds water in dry spells and releases excess in the wet times. This is especially so when used with raised beds. To lift this to a larger scale is possible. Razik Kakar from the blog Camel Food Security and Climate Change has an interesting article on the benefits of camel poo. Link in the show notes. To quote but one sentence from his article. Camel dung is beautiful in its architecture, dry and odourless. I was hooked by that line. I received a further comment from Razak Kakar that I just have to quote in full. Quote, A dairy camel weighing 600 kilograms produces 15 to 17 kilograms of dry manure daily. The racing and other camels produce about half that quantity. In a thousand camel dairy, the daily manure production is about 16,000 kilos. All this asset is going to waste. On the other hand, the date palm waste is also going to waste. This is no use at all. The camel dung with high and diversified levels of microflora can be a potential decomposing agent for the date palm waste. Both waste in combination can be a potential asset for organic farming in the region. End quote. Creating a system to use this much dung and incorporate other waste material to create soil is both possible and necessary. If anyone has any other stories out there of people doing this on large scale, it would be greatly appreciated. Please email me at john at worldorganicnews.com. We now move from the soil to the flowers. Honeybees. Those priceless pollinators who also provide honey, are subject to any number of threats. Neonics, more formally neonicotinoids, a form of pesticide whose intended target is not honeybees, but it kills them anyway. Colony collapse disorder, where it seems reasonably healthy beehives are discovered on the next visit to be full of dead and or dying bees. The varroa mite, which parasitizes bees, leading eventually to a destroyed hive, And now, deformed wing virus. Not only are the wings deformed, so too is the bee's body. This leads obviously to death. It does seem to be connected with varroa mites, but may just be a side effect of the mites weakening the immune system of the bees. This new threat was brought to the attention of World Organic News this week by two blogs. Gardens for Wild Pollinators and Take Part. Doing a back search, I discovered an article from the blog Adopt a Beehive back in October last year on the same virus. Links to all these pieces are in the show notes. It seems humans, fire ants and varroa mites are all vectors for the deformed wing virus, moving it from hive to hive. I wonder what else is lurking in the hives of the world, gnawing away at the futures of these tough little insects. The practice has developed since the Second World War of moving large numbers of hives cross-country chasing flowers in bloom may just be the baseline cause of the growing threats to not just the bees but our entire food system. Once we start tossing pesticides and climate changes into the mix, 
it is no wonder these precious pollinators are under duress. To understand the importance of bees, I have placed a picture of our available foods, with and without bees, in the show notes. To summarise, without bees we would be left with potatoes, cereals, pineapples and a few other fruits. Yes, we could live on these, but would we really want to give up apples, raspberries, peaches and grapes? Just because we didn't do everything we could to maintain the world's bee populations. I think not. This is food for thought, or more accurately, thought required to save our food. And now to our ongoing section on people who have had an impact on the world of organic practice. This week, John Seymour is our focus. His life was full, to say the least. So I've put his biography off to a later show. This week, I'm going to talk about what John Seymour meant and means to me. Way back in the olden days, 1975 to be precise, I walked into Eastwood Library and asked if they had any books on self-sufficiency. Did they have a book for me? John Seymour's The Complete Book of Self-Sufficiency. I was hooked. The book is broken, in the older editions which I prefer and recommend, into sensible divisions. The way to self-sufficiency... Food from the fields, food from animals, food from the garden, food from the wild, natural energy, and finally, crafts and skills. While not in the same order as Mollison and Holmgreen's Permaculture Zone Analysis, it is a great way to understand the systems of food production and the way these systems overlap. The first section, The Way to Self-Sufficiency, has amazing line drawings. The line drawings throughout the book are gorgeous. These first section drawings are an excellent entree into the concept of ecology. The graphic, the natural cycle, places the methods and techniques of agriculture into the cycles of life. From there we are walked through the seasons. This book is unashamedly placed within the temperate northern hemisphere of Western Europe, but that does not downgrade the information in any way. The way to self-sufficiency concludes with a description of how a one-acre or alternatively a five-acre holding, could be set up to achieve self-sufficiency. I read and re-read these one- and five-acre plans. I drew up my own, fiddled with them, rewrote planting guides to match my southern hemisphere location, and generally immersed myself in the book. It burned itself into my consciousness. It is indeed an old friend. Whenever life seemed too full or even empty, Seymour was there sitting quietly on the bookshelf, waiting. It is, for me, one of the half-dozen books of my life. I hope you can find a copy and feel the same wonder. Next week, I'll delve deeper into the complete book of self-sufficiency before we eventually take a trip through the life of John Seymour. Please stay tuned. Any questions, feedback or criticisms are most welcome. Email me at john at worldorganicnews.com. That's john, J-O-N, no H. A transcript of each episode is available on the blog at worldorganicnews.com under the tab Podcasts. The sounds used in this podcast are courtesy of Texas Radio Theatre Company on the free sound site. Links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back again in a week. <laughs>